Hi, everyone, and welcome to the last of our three panels in our symposium on Afghanistan. Our symposium is aiding the fundraising efforts led by the Tufts Association of South Asians to raise money for the International Rescue Committee and International Medical Corps. We will put instructions on how you can best do that in the chat. Today, we will be discussing the impacts of Taliban control on women in Afghanistan. We are very excited to welcome the four incredible women you see this afternoon who have each done work on the topic and will be able to offer their unique experiences. Before we begin, however, we do want to acknowledge that we were planning to have a fifth speaker today from Afghanistan. Unfortunately, she had to return to the refugee camp she's staying in due to her baby sister's lab report and regretted informing us that she could not join today because of the camp's Wi-Fi weakness and not being able to get a stronger connection from any Marines due to security concerns. So I'm now gonna introduce the four panelists we have here today. Lima Ahmed is a PhD candidate in the fields of international security and human security at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. Her research focuses on youth and their vulnerabilities to extreme violence. She founded the Paiwan to Afghan Association that focuses on research regarding women's issues. She has worked with government and international partners in Afghanistan for the past 20 years at different capacities. Ms. Ahmed is an independent researcher with three search reports published, Women's Penal System in Afghanistan, Women's Participation in Peace Process of Afghanistan, and NATO as the Security Sector Reform Organization, and several analytical articles. Tahera Hadayadi is a journalist from Afghanistan. In Kabul, she worked at Suba Kabul Daily Newspaper and ran a column named What Taliban Did to the People. For that column, she interviewed people who lived under the Taliban's rule and wrote and published their stories. She left Afghanistan and relocated to the US after the Taliban released a statement threatening journalists who wrote against them. After the Taliban took over the country, Tahera helped organize an evacuation effort to help 250 Afghans, including female martial artists, singers, women's rights activists, and other at-risk Af at Afghans leave the country and resettle in Canada. Tahera is currently attending college in California, studying bioengineering. Rafia Zakaria is the author of Against White Feminism, The Upstairs Wife, An Intimate History of Pakistan, Veil, and many essays for The Guardian, CNN, and the New York Times Book Review. She is a regular columnist for Dawn in Pakistan and The Baffler in the United States. And Anna Larson is a lecturer in political science at Tufts University and a research associate in the Department of Development Studies at SLAS University of London. She has conducted research on democratization, elections and gender in Afghanistan since 2004 and formerly worked in Kabul for the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. She has a PhD in post-war recovery from the University of York and her book, Derailing Democracy in Afghanistan, co-authored with Noah Coburn, was published by Columbia University Press in 2014. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions throughout the panel, please send them in the Q&A box to be answered at the end of the discussion. I will now pass it on to our moderator for today's panel, Alex Dingle, who is a sophomore majoring in international relations and on the board of Tufts Middle East Research Group. Thank you so much, Emily, for introducing our panel and panelists. And we're going to begin with a brief opening statement from each of our panelists. So Lima, if we could begin with you. Um, thank you, Emily and Alex uh, for having me today here. Um, I had such an emotional morning this uh, uh, today um, because one of my friends who was stuck in Kabul for the past one uh, month, um, I just got the news that she went, she was able to get out. Um, so I completely forgot what to say, but it was uh, for the one month or three and a half weeks we were trying um, to take her out. She was one of the women at high risks. Uh, so for my opening statement, I uh, would just uh, talk about three uh, diff different points that you might have um, heard other panelists also in the past that um, impact of um, Taliban controls over Afghan women. Um, there are immediate impacts that we see it in the media. Uh, girls are not allowed to school. Um, 
women are not allowed to work and uh, uh, life has been just stopped. So it's not impact on women only, but the entire country has just on um, this deadlock a kind of uh, pause. Um, and one point that I want to discuss that this impact, the impact that we talk about, it goes beyond just the Taliban control, but it goes to how we have made this um, Afghan woman as a as a political tool uh, rather than Afghan women as a real human being to be uh, used for for different kind of political in political economic kind of uh, leverage or bargaining, so to say. Uh, Afghan women today, um, Afghan women's reality today is quite different than what we see as a name Afghan women. Um, um, the international community for the past 20 years have used this terminology or political terminologies to justify their aid programs in Afghanistan, their uh, occupation of the country um, over there. And um, any projects or any programs that was implemented in Afghanistan by the name of Afghan women. And today that has been transformed to another group, which is Taliban, as some people call it, um, the uprising group in, in the country, but in most Afghanistan who um, I include myself into that too, we, we just uh, see them as a terrorist project. Um, they also are bargaining now on Afghan women now with the UN or international community that uh, if I'm allowed to, to sit on the UN General Assembly, um, I will give it this and this rights to Afghan women. If I am recognized or my, my government is given legitimacy internationally, I will give one or two or three rights to Afghan women. So in my opinion, the Afghan women in reality is quite far from, from the narrative that we all together have built uh, sur surrounding um, what Afghan women really means there. Uh, are Afghan women all this one and uh, uh, group of human beings that have equal voice, equal needs and equal political demands and way of living and with the agency or it is just something that we, a bullet point uh, at, at the international sittings or at the political sitting to be checkmarked uh, about, do we say that Afghan women have agency to, to do something about it or we are asking we should do something for Afghan women. So these are the questions that I am looking forward to discuss with my fellow uh, panelists and also um, some other fellow students who might have questions that what are their um, opinion about this thing that we always hear this terminology Afghan women. Uh, do we put um, human beings in that category or this is more now a political terminology that uh, we are using? Thank you. Thank you so much. Tahra, if we could go to you next. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for you guys to, for organizing this event. And uh, thank you for letting me just have a voice here to talk about it. Uh, as you also mentioned it for the last month and maybe for the last 40 days, uh, almost 40 days since Kabul fell. I have been a part of an evacuation effort for taking mostly like girls and their families that who were at risk and some other like female activists or singers and martial artists and even some female students out and uh, we secured them luckily Canadian visas our first group or our first group of 26 they are already settled in um, Canada and our second group they just like one week ago they they could get out and they are now in Pakistan and waiting to get processed. Uh, one of the things, I mean, it was the thing that for the last 39 days or 40 days, I've been like, more focused on that or I've been busy with that or I've been doing it. And um, after that, now that we are trying to organize a second evacuation, we have like very limited visas or funding and everything. And it's getting difficult because we have a long list and have to choose between them, how to choose that who is more deserving 
what woman you should take out first. And we have to go through that judgment of thinking about it that, okay, this person is a very like a young female student, a hardworking student from a very like, that comes from a very difficult background. But on the other hand, the person who we have to compare them together is a, an activist, a female activist who put like her life at risk. And, like making that decision, making the judgment or thinking about it that, okay, this person, she was very helpful, but like she has her entire family and they're not going to leave, like just the woman is not going to leave them behind and they're going to take like take seven spots. So we can, we could like save, I don't know, seven other single women who are at higher risk. Just going through that judgment and thinking about it that who you should save and who is more deserving when Afghanistan is not safe for anyone and it's not safe for any woman at all. And that risk level is getting higher and higher. The first thing they are in Afghanistan after that being a woman, after that being a single woman, after that being an, a single outspoken woman in Afghanistan. And at the same time, like hearing horrible news from back home, Right now, most of the focus is on Kabul. The media, media attention is on Kabul, but what's going on in other provinces? Like the girls' names being like recorded and gathered by these like local people through mosques and everything. And the fear that we have had like moms, mothers reaching out to us and saying that, okay, I don't have my husband. I lost him like years ago. I just have this one daughter. She's, for example, 15 or 16. Just take her out wherever you can. I just don't want, and it's, uh, it's, it's most like what we are, I'm personally thinking and dealing and I'm, I'm looking forward to discuss just being a voice for those women who right now in this, let audience who are here, they can hear it. And maybe if, if there can be anything, at least knowing about them, knowing that what's going on there. Thank you so much. Um, Rafia, if we could go with you next. Um, you know, I completely agree with uh, Tahira and Nima. Um, you know, particularly with the sentiment that Afghan women have been um, made into a political bargaining chip. Uh, I don't think it's really possible to talk about what Afghan women are undergoing um, under the Taliban without also talking about what um, the U.S. NATO presence, how the U.S. NATO presence and American feminists in general, um, you know, used Afghan women as a means to both burnish their own feminist credentials, um, you know, to look at, uh, to appear as the white feminist saviors of these poor downtrodden women, um, but also, of course, by the American state that wanted, uh, you know, a nice packaging for a strategic war and occupation, and you know they fell upon, um, they fell upon Afghan women. It's important to remember that feminist majority was carrying out um, a program called and gender apartheid in Afghanistan in the 1990s, uh, prior to 9-11 and prior to the invasion. And that once, um, once the, the invasion happened, or, you know, if it, there, it was going to happen, uh, the leaders of feminist majority were present when Colin Powell announced the invasion and were in consultation with the Bush administration in those early days of the invasion. And I mention that because I think it's important to note that within the American political landscape, 
uh, the war in Afghanistan, particularly this quote unquote liberating Afghan women was, um, you know, what was very much um, a project that, um, you know, that they, that they felt was um, going to yield dividends in terms of uh, American national reputation. So, um, you know, so there is an intentional, you know, the, the contrast you see between the Taliban and, you know, the aid economy that was created by the United States, um, you know, illustrates in many ways uh, how Afghan women have always been given, you know, two terrible choices. So on one hand is, you know, the obscurantism and oppression inflicted by the Taliban. On the other hand is this aid economy that is essentially furnished by various aid organizations and various countries to follow the line of we're doing something good over there. Um, of course, now all the lies have been exposed. Uh, I think the two speakers uh, did an excellent job of pointing out exactly how dire and how absolutely heartrending and devastating the situation is. But even in this situation, it, it should be remembered that, for instance, you know, the money uh, Afghanistan's reserves are still frozen here in the United States, so that even those Afghan women who are left there, who are government workers, or whose husbands are government workers, are they're not able to be paid. Uh, and, you know, the, there's also talk of uh, increasing sanctions on that government, uh, which, I mean, I understand in terms of, you know, opposition to the Taliban, but I think also need to be evaluated in terms of the impact they are going to have on ordinary Afghans. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that this situation where exit is just about the only hope or choice offered to Afghan women uh, is a consequence of what was done uh, and not done in the 20 years of US NATO occupation. Thank you so much. Professor Larson, if we could end with you. Sure. Um, first of all, let me say how um, privileged I feel to be here um, on the same panel as Lima, Tahira, and Rafia. It's, it's, it's a real honor to be here with you. And um, I'm involved in a constant struggle to rid myself of my West-centric and Eurocentric bias. Uh, it's, it's difficult, um, something that's hard to, to shed, but at least to acknowledge that all the time, I think is really important. And I'd always defer to you, um, particularly um, Salima and Tahira with your um, very uh, current experience and, and knowledge. Um, and so um, thank you very much for your, your incredible perspectives and to, and to Rafia too, um, you know, and just thank you for the work that, that you're doing at the moment. I think it's critically important. And um, so I just wanted to start with that. And I also don't, I don't want to take too much time, but just to, to echo what's been said already, absolutely um, women have been used as a political tool, as part of the political narrative, a bargaining chip, um, not only now, not only recently, but since when, I don't know, since uh, at least the, the Russians, uh, if not before then. Um, and so this is a this is a constant theme that, that, that comes up again and again, women's rights, women's freedoms being used as a, as a bargaining chip. So, so thank you, Lima, for highlighting that uh, important point. And then I was just going to sort of add on to, to Rafia's point as well about um, the, the occupation, the, the intervention in Afghanistan and how it's very tempting at this point, particularly given the apparent swift nature of the change to Taliban rule to make a distinction or a very stark distinction between now and you know three months ago and that the sort of the period of the, the intervention versus the period of Taliban rule where as I think Rafia was pointing out 
there are many similarities, many con continuities that need to be pointed out. Um, for example, Fahund and Malexada was um, abducted, was, was, was um, just mobbed, lynched in Kabul in 2015 in broad daylight. That's under Ashraf Ghani's government. We need to not forget that there is, a, a, there has been an incredible struggle that women have lived through in Afghanistan for a really long time. And I absolutely echo what Rafael was saying at this of the hypocrisy of the, the Western narratives that, that come in pretending to be saviors in 2004, when the women who stood up at the lawyer Jirga tent against warlords had been struggling under, uh, and under horrendous circumstances under the Mujahideen government and before and were sort of the bravest women you could ever meet and yet were portrayed as these, these helpless victims that needed the West. So I, I feel like I have had the privilege to meet and work with incredible people in Afghanistan, incredibly brave people whose um, women and men uh, whose uh, efforts I feel go overlooked a lot um, and I would like to just make mention of, of, of their work because I was very privileged to, to have had the opportunity to work with them. Thank you so much Professor Larson. Now we're going to get started into the questions um, and then we will leave some time at the end. So again if anyone has questions please feel free to put them in the Q&A. So as many of you mentioned in your opening statements, Afghan women have long been used as political tools or political bargaining chips. One of the major reasons American administrations from Bush to Biden have given to justify the occupation of Afghanistan was advocating for their rights. How much did the rights of Afghan women actually shift over the course of the American occupation of Afghanistan? Lima, yes, please feel free to speak. Uh, I would just um, um, add to that, that even that question, um, the framing of this question is um, where I have problem with, uh, because this brings Afghan women as a, as a someone or people or a population that needed help. The country was divided between men and women and the Afghan women had to be saved. Um, you heard Tyra. Tyra is one of the very few, like very few Afghan women that I am even um, aware that since this uh, fall of the Kabul have been working day and night, night taking Afghan women or people, students, women out, because that's not that we want it. It's, there is no other choice between life and death. If Afghan women are asked to, what, what is the solution? The solution is not to take the entire 15 men, million women out because there is, the situation right now is not suitable for any woman, as Tyra mentioned. My own family is right now in the camp shattered around the world. I have helped more than 500 um, people out. So if that is seen as a, as, as a power or as a person with agency, Afghan women always had agency. During the Taliban time, they were going, running schools and businesses in, in, in the basements. Isn't that seen as a, as, a, as a power? But if we say power as a, what we see in the West, what power is, and that is given to Afghan women but with, the, with the age money, that's, I think that's a kind of limiting the understanding of what we are calling the rights. And the aid money, yes, it provided economy to the country, it provided opportunities for educations, and it made it a little bit easier. But it made it also difficult for women in Tyra and myself, because right now, you won't believe it, we are not given platforms, because we are considered not to be the real Afghan women, because we are educated, so we are considered the elite Afghan women or the diaspora Afghan women. And because we got education through aid money or through that. So now we, they, they are not giving platform even for publication. The real Afghan women who are victim, who get bitten, those has to come and say things. When they start saying things, and then again, they are saying somebody is behind them that they are able to protest now. But in Kabul, we saw in previous weeks that young girl from Generation Z 
they were all on the streets. They never knew how Taliban violence was. So they were facing them. Even in my, my generation of women would have not been. So still you see in the Western media that these women might have been supported by some other kind of force that they didn't have agency. So the age many or the 20 past 20 years in Afghanistan was, I don't think so, it was the aid money that gave Afghan women rights, but it was more the freedom, the country that it deserved was allowed, um, where Afghan women were themselves doing stuff. I don't think so anybody was particularly behind them what they were doing. Even before the fall of the, the, the Kabul for the past one year, I think Afghan women were the sole agent of uh, denying whatever that was happening. They were the biggest lobbyists saying that the uh, agreement with the Taliban and, and the US is wrong. What will the, what the consequences of this agreement will be and how the pull out of the US withdrawal will result in. Afghan women never advocated, in my opinion, that occupation has to stay in Afghanistan forever. But they always caution the world that how how it should be done, this has to be led by Afghans, how this uh, process has to be done, how the power transfer has to be done. There has to be a say that is given to women that they come and say like how you do it. So in my opinion, um, it is really limiting Afghan women agency to say that the past 20 years have given Afghan women rights. No, the country was in civil war, that civil war was stopped. The rest, everything was forming as a society and Afghan women were part of that society. Uh, also followed by that, I, I would say that even if we think that there was like US effort on men and women in Afghanistan, I, if we wanna just like talk about that gender part, I do believe like whatever that US did or US says that they did, it was in major cities like, but how many major cities like, even not in all of them, for example, in four or five more famous cities like Mazar Sharif or Kabul or Herat, but like the majority of people, the majority of women who were under a lot of like, they had a lot of problems and their rights were not given to them. They were not in these big cities. They were in like villages. They were in tribal lands. They, and I, I really don't think that there was a big impact even in terms of like those freedoms for them for, for going to school. We had like this province, I, I forgot the exact name right now, I, but last year it was the first year that they had girls graduating from high school. And that maybe there was a lot of projects on funding for, for women, but I just feel like I personally don't think there was a lot of impact on that way. And not only in that part, even with the evacuation that happened. As Lima John mentioned, it's, as an Afghan woman, I personally did not expect US to stay in Afghanistan forever. It's more about how they left the country. And even in those evacuations, that like US is saying that they did evacuate 120,000 Afghans. Who did they evacuate? And among them, how many women are there? How many of them? We, we can see like photos of women being in DC's airport with burqas. And or like, I've heard it from a friend of mine who was in a camp that a woman was beaten up by her husband in a US camp in DC. It's like, even people who US got evacuated, if, it's, if it was about women, that woman right is just not being respected inside US soil. So how they are claiming that they did it in Afghanistan. Maybe I can also uh, um, add just to that, that observation, just that I think when we're asking some about the impact of the American intervention or the, the international intervention in Afghanistan over 20 years, we're kind of imagining that, that that intervention is neutral or that it's, if not neutral, then positive. And, you know, I mean, those are very loaded terms, but I mean, we were fighting a war. And I think you have to remember that in war, there are um, 
measures that are taken, maybe for expediency's sake, maybe because the Americans and international forces are beholden first and foremost to their own citizens, not to Afghans, that you know there are measures that are taken that will make things very difficult for civilians on the ground and will worsen gender conflict, will worsen um, situations for women just because it's part of a war. So for example, you're giving fuel to um, to, to anti-West groups and to, to, to groups who want to see Afghanistan rid of, of foreign in, invaders, you're giving fuel to them all the time. Every time a difficult decision is made about needing to uh, target a certain civilian area because there are insurgents there or needing to do night raids or needing to, to conduct warfare because it is warfare, right? Um, these are difficult decisions that are that are made all the time, and yet they give fuel to those anti-West sentiments. They um, encourage sort of an, um, an anti-democracy, uh, anti-freedom sort of stance, I think, um, and uh, and can make things very difficult for for women. So I think we just we just, we need to remember that. This 20 year intervention, if you want to call it an intervention, um, it's not a neutral one and had a lot of impact purely, you know, by its very existence. Um, and, we, and we need to we need to remember that. I think I'd like to add that. I mean, not only was it not neutral, it's devastating. I mean, even while this was happening, there is a drone strike which killed 10 civilians and the American general uh, just kind of stood there and said, sorry, you know, we thought they were ISIS, so we bombed them. But of course, that family uh, is left with, you know, dealing with that carnage. I think that it's fair to say that the value of Afghan women to um, the Western narrative, which very much is uh, n not only uh, pretends to be neutral, but actually pretends to be good, you know, like the good guys. And I think that the, their value to that narrative uh, existed when they were using them to justify the occupation of Afghanistan. And as soon as, you know, they were no longer interested um, and were like, okay, well, you know, we're done here. We don't really like want to be out there doing this, this stuff in Afghanistan anymore. <laughs> they, they packed up and they left with absolutely no regard of what they were leaving behind. And now you have these piecemeal refugee efforts, but you know, what sort of country are you bringing these Afghan refugees to? You're bringing them into an extremely Islamophobic, uh, you know, a country that, you know, fit where a, at least half think all Muslims are terrorists. So, I mean, I think that um, this idea that, um, you know, if, if people can take away one thing from, from here, they should be disabused of the fact that, you know, uh, the white and Western people who went out there uh, essentially to get revenge for 9-11 were somehow carrying out this benevolent and altruistic effort over there. I don't think that was the case at all. I think that there was a strategic interest in having a presence in South Asia, and uh, this was looked at a, as a good way uh, to package that. And it was packaged very effectively to the extent that even, you know, whatever three weeks ago, when this um, withdrawal was happening, it was all still focused on these ridiculous and reductionist uh, theatricals where, you know, you have a blonde, white, CNN anchor putting on a burqa and Kabul and standing at the burqa shop and, you know, using these um, these stereotypes that you would think 
that in 20 years uh, would not exist anymore. And so, you know, when you have waste at such a immense level, right? I mean, just even the promote program that USAID ran wasted $400 million. Like the special inspector general has said, USAID cannot account for that money. Nobody knows where it went. And, you know, when you have, when you see something like that, you can only impute that, you know, the act, bringing about actual meaningful change and creating political capacity among Afghan women, um, facilitating not what, you know, white Westerners thought they should do, but what they actually wanted to do. I mean, there is no effort in that. And it can, you know, it can only be intentional uh, when you see numbers like $400 million, uh, you know, uh, who are, that are just like, nobody knows where they are. Thank you. And going off of some of your points, many in the West have heavily focused on the burqa when discussing Afghanistan, especially in the media. However, the Revolutionary Association of Women in Afghanistan has said removing the burqa is, quote, in no way an indication of women's rights and liberties, end quote. Why do you think that there is such an emphasis on this garment? And how does this conversation take away from listening to the voices and needs of Afghan women? Rafia, we can begin with you and then um, whoever else wants to speak. Um, you know, I think my, uh, you know, as I was saying, I think that the burqa is taken as a convenient stereotype in which, you know, there's like a visible, you know, there's, there's political theater in the burqa and everybody uses it, whether, uh, you know, it's the Taliban who want to come in and force everyone to wear it or, you know, the Americans that want to say, oh my God, so many rights for women in Kabul, they're roaming around without a burqa. I mean, either way, it's a problem. And, you know, the meaning of these garments is deeply contextual. I mean, in, in you know, in Pakistan, sometimes when you're going to a crowded market, I would wear one simply for the reason that it provides a degree of physical, like, security in, spaces that are dominated by men, you know, in a country where public space is still very dominated by men. So I think that this emphasis on the burqa, and it, it honestly makes me sick to my stomach because there was even a Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, who actually did the first whole theater on the floor of the Congress where she put on a burqa and then she talked about how oppressive it was and and then she took it off and that was the reason to invade afghanistan in 2001 and you know she appeared again wearing a burqa at the met gala this two weeks ago so it it's become very sickening to me um how this uh, garment is you know there's no effort to really understand what it means contextually and the complexity of what it might mean for different Afghan women, as Rima said, of, you know, who are not a monolith, who don't all believe the same thing. Um, and it's become this sort of, um, you know, almost like a, a, a pop culture slash a white woman self-congratulation uh, element that, oh my God, you know, uh, look, we don't have to wear these things, so we're so liberated. I think it's it's just an absolutely absurd idea. And the fact that we see it repeated again and again after 20 years, honestly, just really depresses and disappoints me. Um, I would uh, just add to what uh, Rafia has already said. I will give you a few statistics um, before um, my point. Um, I had a research done in 2019, giving you some numbers on the, the terminologies that we know, like the Afghan National uh, Police and Army, we had 4,500 uh, women there. For Afghan doctors, we had 4,600 doctors, um, practicing doctors. 
we had 101 1,000 univers university students in the main cities. These statistics were like taken from the main cities, not even um, big, uh, small provinces or districts. Uh, 3,000, approximately 3,000 university professors and um, 600, 60,000 female teachers in Afghan schools, 3 million point five uh, uh, Afghan female students, and there are female uh, uh, servants working, 85,000 women, 800 women-run businesses with 1,700 businesses. We rarely hear about these statistics about Afghan women. What we hear is just a clothing. Afghan women agency is just limited. Um, I would just give you like a metaphor if somebody is discussing um, a hoodie or any kind of fashion that in the West is wear that every day, that is the only identity being discussed about the freedom or not freedom of uh, American women, European women, or other women around the world. But Afghan women is just seen that, oh, if this clothing is off and off, that is like the right state they own. Burqa or any kind of clothing is a choice and should be considered a choice. When I say Afghan women have been dealt as a political tool, that's why their choice is also, also not, not their own. Their agency is taken from them. I, in my family, my mother-in-law choose to wear burqa until yesterday with the 20 years of freedom that was given to Afghan women. She chose and the daughter-in-law or her daughters are not wearing it. So there are clothing, we, co we can go, in the history why these clothing came to being when we want to find out, but just being Afghan women only limited to the, her clothing and not having a choice. Like even in Afghanistan for the past 20 years, we didn't have a law where there was a law that would impose clothing on women. It was a choice. Of course, in, as uh, Rafia mentioned that in male dominated societies, women need to secure themselves. Either it is clothing, whatever you take it. So you would choose stuff that you feel protected by, but it, it was never imposed. But I'm sure all of you uh, might have seen it in the media where the Taliban show of women where Kim Kardashian also put on that kind of a show in Mid Gala that when women, their eyes are not even, um, uh, uh, you can't see their eyes, their hands are covered and everything. That was again a main, like a covered issue in the Western media where you saw that this is what Taliban would do about their clothing. It could be a choice, but why we are not discussing male clothing anywhere in the world, even if it is an oppressed society like Afghanistan or if it is any advanced country in the world. So th the issue where I see is that politicization of women bodies and in my country is going back to how on the surface we look at the issues, how we undermine what women on the ground really are doing rather than just what other people are talking about. I think there were so many, my, my Afghan friends where we were mad about the point where Rafia has mentioned that the moment Taliban took over uh, the Kabul, we saw all these Western journalists wearing all these abayas and, and hijabs and stuff. For me, my thing was, you are doing this so they can impose it on me too. Taliban will never go after a Western journalist that why you are not wearing chadar. So why you are doing it and making it a kind of rule for me to also I follow. So there, 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 were, there, are, there are many things where we think we are helping Afghanistan or Afghan women, but when you don't include Afghan women voices into your help, that is where the flaw comes because that is where you create this hierarchy that I know. So I'm gonna help you the way I think I'm gonna help you rather than asking them how they wanna be helped, which kind of support they need uh, from the world. Uh, also, I think I, I totally agree with what Lema and Rafia mentioned, but I think maybe at the beginning, just that burqa was a symbol to show, like, I don't know, saying that it's like a cage or restrictions that women had to follow. And slowly it has become something that 
something that looked more interesting and could have more audience and could be more attractive for media to say like, wow, this is a situation that Afghan women are living under that. And in the like protests that happen, or most of the things when, when it's about Taliban in the media, the photos that they try to advertise through them, it's more focused on that Borga instead of, I don't know, a lot of other rights that they are losing, like their education rights, their work, and even having a voice to speak out, the forced marriages that people are scared and like they are gathering lists and all these things. It's more about like just focusing on that one thing that was supposed to be a symbol of the cage that they might be there or not might, they are there, or, but they have to deal with it. And Borka is like the way that Lima mentioned it, it's a choice for a big group of Afghan women, people who are living in like more male dominated provinces or like in, in provinces that are even like for, I wore a burqa when I didn't want to be recognized for my own safety. And it's, it's not like I'm, I'm against that. I don't like support it, but I say that not everyone who wears burqa, they are like under a lot of pressure and they are that poor Afghan woman who needs this pity. There are a lot of other things that as an Afghan woman, I do expect like countries or communities that they are, they claim they are fighting for Afghan women's right or for women's right to think about them and mention them instead of just saying that, okay, there is this necessary kind of hijab for women. They are losing their education. They are losing their livelihood. They can't go out. Even like widowed women are scared of their lives being forcefully married to a Taliban member. And I, I just feel like wearing a burqa is a big problem for me, but maybe it's not a problem for, a, I don't know, a, a woman in a village in the West or in the South, but being forcefully married to a Taliban member, to a terrorist, it's a problem for all of Afghan women who are in that situation. Not being able to go to school, not being able to learn how to read, how to write, and never becoming independent financially, never having a job, just being that like wife that they expect you to be. It's just, I don't say no one talks about them, they do, but it's not enough. And it's more about like, to me, it sounds that media are more looking to find like audience and make their own topics very hot. And instead of really doing what maybe they are claiming that it's their values or it's what they are working towards that. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to open up the floor to some of the audience questions. And so one question we have is what are ways that our audience members today can support Afghan women? Um. It's short, just um, I think Afghan women need uh, platforms. Um, they should um, be seen as allies rather than um, subjects. Um, uh, wherever you have a platform where you could have a hear to listen to. Um, I think if all of you are following um, Afghan or you are interested in issues in Afghanistan, you might have seen in social media and the biggest campaigner are women right now. Whatever issue is raised, you would see a lot of Twitter handlers, a lot of like any social media you see, women are up there. They are, um, they are in the camps, they are um, in Afghanistan, they are cooking for their children, they are fear fearful for their lives, but they still have this time to say that I'm gonna speak up. So in my opinion, um, Understanding that is the biggest support uh, I think anyone in the world can give. And also try to not only understand yourself, but advocate on behalf of them. Um, why is it not a question for any one of us living, living in peaceful countries that what we know of the human rights violation, we are not okay. 
we have you and we have all these global governance kind of organizations, but everything in the books that we are see, we uh, have acknowledged them as a human rights violation that is happening in Afghanistan, but we still go about our lives. We still don't see that as a threat to humanity. We still think like, oh, that is a really tribal far away stone age country. So they cannot be fixed. I think Afghans are not, or Afghan women are not expecting that they need to be fixed. Um, we just want to be recognized as a fellow human beings. And, and when, for me, it was really shocking that the UN Security Council went on a break for a long weekend when hundreds of people were dying. Like we, every night I get calls, a girl on the run that um, she will be forcefully married or people being killed in provinces in any kind of way. And these are not hidden from the UN, we report to them, we shout out to them, and the world is quiet. Um, so for me, it is like, why it is still okay uh, by us, like we all human beings, we get, we know about it, like American students right now, they know what is happening about Afghanistan and, and everyone, they're not only women, why we just think it's okay. Are there any um, social media handles or organizations that you recommend donating to or news sources where we can learn from? Just combining some questions that have also come up now from audience members. Is this question specifically for me? You can begin, but whoever also would like to chime in would be happy to hear from as many of you. I mean, they can start by just going on Twitter and write Afghanistan. I, they will be amazed to see um, how much Afghans are right now and um, explaining the situation, putting everything they could up there so the world could see it. And I think that's making us so, uh, the energy makes so drained that whatever we are saying, whatever tools we are using, um, still the world is blind, like they just don't see it. So I think it won't be um, much difficult to find out what is happening in Afghanistan. Murphy, go ahead. Oh. Um, I think that, uh, you know, these uh, sort of immediate things like learning more about this issue and uh, <clears throat> supporting Afghans are important, but I think it's also important uh, on a larger framework um, to to understand and 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 be very suspicious of um, you know future strategic efforts that um, essentially take. You know, I mean, I think that women's rights in Afghanistan, the issue of women's rights in reality has been so delegitimized now because, uh, you know, foreigners, Westerners used it for their own purposes. So it's important to remember that not only did things not get better, things actually got worse. Uh, but on a larger uh, scale, it's, you know, there are f 15 large transnational humanitarian aid organizations um, that, that provide aid, humanitarian aid in the world. And in those 15 organizations, of the boards of these organizations, only 2% of the boards of these organizations even belong to a country that has seen a humanitarian crisis or um, you know or or essentially uh, needs has ever needed assistance so this means that you know 98 percent of the people are white and western and they're making all the decisions about you know how humanitarian aid is going to be disbursed 
what form, you know, what metrics, whatever. And that is a grave and important problem that American students in the West need to work on. Because until aid remains as white as it is, these problems are going to be repeated. Because as you heard, the people who need the help, the people who are on the ground, who are, um, you know, who, who know what has to be done and what they need to get things done, um, are not being listened to. Their reach is not far enough. You know, they're kept, they're told to tell their sad stories, but then, you know, white people come in and they make all the policy decisions and sit on all the boards and, you know, dictate the discourse. So I think that that is something that, you know, American Western students who are globally engaged need to be aware of and need to work against. Um, you know, this, this sort of divide where all the, you know, aid dispersing decisions are made by white people and black and brown people are the people who are, you know, bombed and who are the people who are given the aid. Uh, also following by like, when they ask how to help Afghan women, I, I do believe that not all the Afghan women we are talking about are women who are left in the in the country, even a big group of them who got evacuated, who are not all of them are educated, not all of them are from, not all of them have like those freedoms and the culture that they have grown in, the families they've grown in, they are, they, they still look at themselves, the people who they were back home in Afghanistan in their families with their husbands. And maybe one of the things that I'm not still sure about the ways that, for example, help could be, in a, except like knowing about them and trying to be a voice for them, like direct help or immediate help right now in Afghanistan organizations that they can help with that. But I was thinking that one, one way that people can help in the US is help those women who are just, who just got here to the settle in the US to get an education, help them like get to universities help to provide them therapy sessions because all of them have been going through traumas when most of them like for a big part of their lives not only during this withdrawal or like helping them get a job to for them to feel like what it means to be independent with the hope that maybe the next generation after them after them will be a different generation they will like they will have different daughters and uh, also, um, I'm not still sure, but the team that I'm working with for evacuation, we are looking and trying to find ways for helping women education for longer term or another aspect. I don't know if there is any way that I could reach out to you when we have the plan or, uh, yeah. Can I just add to sort of that? that? point that Tahira made, supporting women who are already here, supporting Afghan families who are already in the US. One way, a practical thing that we can do, I believe, is to write to our senators, write to our legislators, um, to push for temporary protected status to be assigned to Afghanistan. So this is a, a status that would allow Afghans, regardless of their ability to prove their individual persecuted status as refugees, to stay longer in the United States, as long as they're seen to be a credible, incredibly violent and um, difficult situation in Afghanistan. And so write to your senators. I have done that and received positive responses. It's it's a good thing to be able to do um, just on a sort of on a policy level. And the other thing is just to, to continue to, to try. I don't know how to do this really on an individual basis, but to put pressure on neighboring countries as well. I've been trying to um, help a family uh, in um, north of Afghanistan to, to get out to Uzbekistan. And the administrative barriers that have been put up on all the borders have been so ridiculous. Like these countries countries, Pakistan, India, Uzbekistan, they're advertising these humanitarian emergency visas and they're not granting any. It makes them look good to, to, to advertise them. But 
they're very slow in their administrative process and surely the most basic like acknowledgement of somebody's human rights and dignity is to give them the choice of whether or not to be able to stay or to leave and people are not able to get across borders by themselves they need to be able to make that choice so I just put that out there if there's any pressure that can be put on neighboring countries to um to at least allow people to apply for visas, even if not to grant them, at least allow them to apply, um, then, you know, that would seem to be an you know, obvious step forward. Thank you so much for um, everyone who's speaking. And just in the interest of time, I would like to say this ends our panel and our symposium on Afghanistan. Um, we are truly so grateful and appreciative and for all those comments and insights and Tahira will definitely be in touch about um, what you were mentioning. Um, and again, um, thank you very much for coming and um, for you know, being part of this and for giving us this hour and to listen to all of your incredible voices and perspectives. We are truly, truly grateful um, and we couldn't have thought of a better way to um, end our symposium.